If a woman is in her reproductive age group and was already having periods and has since stopped for greater than six months, by definition, she has secondary amenorrhea. Most OBs are not going to wait six months before they decide if a patient is pregnant. So generally, after one or two cycles of missed or skipped periods, you begin the workup. And you begin the workup with the easy to get and most common things. By far, the most common cause of missed periods or secondary amenorrhea is pregnancy. This is a simple test to check for, get a urine pregnancy test, and then there's an entire section labeled OB for this medical condition. The second most common thing is hypothyroidism. To screen for hypothyroid, get a TSH. Now remember, if they are hypothyroid, the TSH will be elevated. Less common, but right up there, is prolactin. Either a prolactinemia, that is just prolactin in the blood that's elevated, or a prolactinoma, a tumor in the anterior pituitary that drives prolactinemia. You screen for this with a prolactin level. Medications can do it. And generally, the medications induce a prolactinemia. We'll talk about the mechanism of these in just a second. So when you screen their medication lists, you're also screening with a prolactin. And finally, if these causes are negative, you'll assess the axis, the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Let's first talk about the mechanism of how everything but pregnancy can cause secondary amenorrhea. And to that, we turn to our axis. The hypothalamus tells the anterior pituitary to tell the ovaries to make the uterus bleed. And the hypothalamus produces TRH. And for this graphic, anything in red is going to turn off the reproductive axis. That is, it's going to induce secondary amenorrhea. The hypothalamus secretes TRH. TRH tells the anterior pituitary to make TSH. And likewise, anything in green is going to stimulate the axis to occur. The hypothalamus also secretes GnRH. And GnRH stimulates the production of FSH and LH. But the anterior pituitary also produces prolactin. And what prolactin does in large enough doses is turns off GnRH. So this is where we're going to focus most of our attention on prolactin. Anything that elevates prolactin, anything that causes a prolactinemia, is going to turn off GnRH. If you turn off GnRH, you turn off, turn off FSH and LH. If you don't have any FSH or LH, you cannot have a reproductive cycle. So the goal here is to recognize the things that increase prolactin levels. One of those things is an elevated TRH. Excess TRH induces stimulation of prolactin. Don't worry about how, it just does. So that if you have a hypothyroid state, you lose the feedback inhibition on TRH. And t excess TRH produces excess prolactin, which is how hypothyroidism can induce secondary amenorrhea. Normally, dopamine inhibits prolactin. Inhibiting the inhibitor disinhibits the axis. So the presence of dopamine produces reproductive cycles. If you put someone on a medication that inhibits dopamine, such as an atypical antipsychotic, a dopamine blocker, this is complicated with a number of inhibitions, but dopamine blockers block dopa, which normally block prolactin, but now, because the dopamine is being blocked, prolactin is allowed to act and block GnRH. 
basically is if you put someone on a dopamine antagonist, you increase the levels of prolactin, increasing the levels of prolactin, shot off the axis. And finally, you can just have a tumor of the anterior pituitary that makes too much prolactin. A prolactinoma autonomously secretes prolactin. So let's just say it again. If you have elevated levels of prolactin, you shut off the axis. The three ways you can do that is by putting someone on a medication that blocks dopamine. Simply have a hypothyroid state and elevated TRH drives prolactin production. Or you can have an autonomously secreting tumor of the anterior pituitary that is secreting prolactin. Those are the ways you're going to get secondary amenorrhea from the most common causes. In addition, hypothyroidism on its own, even without elevations in TRH, can cause secondary amenorrhea and pregnancy is your most likely cause. We've covered the first four. The rest of the lecture is going to be dedicated to an endocrinology lecture about the hypothalamic pituitary axis. To understand what's going to happen with the algorithm, we're going to re-review the HP axis. We're going to start at the hypothalamus. We're going to go through each of the levels to build a differential, and then I'm going to show you the way you work it up. At the hypothalamus, if something is wrong with the hypothalamus, the entire process can never even get started. But it's very difficult to impact the hypothalamus directly. So normally it is going to be a systemic illness that causes be worried about living, not about reproduction, so it will turn off the reproductive axis. And generally, high emotional stress is enough to cause one or two missed periods, but it's generally not sustained long enough to cause greater than six months worth of secondary amenorrhea. But these are the causes of the hypothalamic causes of secondary amenorrhea. At the anterior pituitary, two things can happen. Either you don't have enough anterior pituitary because of necrosis, or you have something up taking up the space. That is, you have a tumor that grows and sort of takes up all of the space. And again, the body is designed to survive. So if it's going to preserve the function of ACTH and TSH over FSH and LH, so if this adenoma is growing and consuming a lot of the pituitary, it's going to turn off FSH and LH production. To get necrosis, you have two syndromes, Sheehan's and apoplexy. We'll talk about these when we go through the algorithm. These are anterior pituitary necrosis, death of the anterior pituitary. At the level of the ovary, you can have, again, two problems. Either Savage syndrome, resistant ovary syndrome, or menopause. In this instance, the anterior pituitary produces the signal, but the ovary simply does not respond to it. And finally, at the level of the endometrium, you have to ask, can this patient bleed at all? And the things that will prevent that have been a previous ablation, we did it on purpose, or Asherman syndrome, fibrosis of the endometrium. To evaluate the axis, we start at the bottom and work our way up. We ask the question, can the endometrium bleed? We answer that question first with a progestin challenge. Progestin will take an already developed endometrium and just cause it to slough off. You only have to go higher on the chain if your test is negative. The second test is an estrogen and progesterone challenge. Okay, 
It wasn't ready to bleed, but now can it? In order to assess the ovaries, you want to know, is there a signal coming from the anterior pituitary, or is the ovary simply deficient in its ability to respond? Get an FSH and LH level. They will be elevated if the ovaries are broken. In order to assess the anterior pituitary, you have to decide, is there a mass or is there necrosis? This is done with an MRI. And finally, the hypothalamus. If all of this stuff doesn't tell you your answer, this is the diagnosis of exclusion and probably could have been identified on history and physical alone. So this is the path we're going to take. Let's begin with our algorithm on what to do when someone presents with secondary amenorrhea. That is, someone who complains of missed periods for more than six months. The first thing you're going to do is rule out the common stuff. Urine pregnancy test, prolactin level, and a TSH. This is usually all done at the same visit. If the UPT is positive, she's pregnant. See the OB lectures. Begin prenatal care. If the TSH is elevated, she's got hypothyroid. Give her what she doesn't have. Give her Synthroid. Levothyroxine, give her the T4 she needs. And if the prolactin level is elevated, you have a prolactinemia. You have to decide, is this from medications or is this a tumor? So get the MRI to differentiate the prolactinoma from another cause. Prolactinomas are discussed in great detail in the medicine endocrine lectures. You treat them with bromocryptine or surgery. If the MRI is negative, it's some other cause, probably medications. And by the way, prolactinemia usually presents with galactorrhea and amenorrhea. If you have both of those symptoms in your STEM question, it presume it is a prolactinemia and go chasing that with a prolactin level and then an MRI. This is the common stuff. And let's presume you've looked over their medications so you know that's not it. Now you have to begin accessing the axis. Let's assess the HP axis. And you do that first with the progestin challenge. You ask, is the endometrium already developed? Has it already proliferated and is just waiting for the signal to bleed? If she bleeds, she essentially is anovulatory because during the first, period, first part of the ovulatory cycle, she's going to produce estrogen. In the second half, after ovulation, comes progesterone. If she's just waiting for that progestin signal, she is anovulatory and most likely has polycystic ovarian syndrome. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is a disease where all the follicles are ready to go, they just can't ovulate. She produces excess testosterone. She has lots of estrogen around to proliferate the endometrium, but doesn't have the signal to actually bleed. This patient will generally be hirsute, fat, and hairy. You're going to learn more about this in the masculinization lectures as well as in the vaginal bleeding lecture. You can stop now because you have your answer. But if she does not bleed with progestin, the next step is the estrogen and progesterone challenge. And you ask, in the absence of the rest of the axis, can we proliferate the endometrium and then make it bleed? Here, if she cannot bleed, 
The endometrium is the problem. It is endometrial dysfunction. This occurs in the case of Asherman syndrome and ablation. If a woman presents with significant bleeding, menometrorrhagia, especially if she's older and does not desire any more kids, we can do an ablation. We put a balloon into her uterus, heat it up, and basically burn the lining of the endometrium. This will prevent her from bleeding again. We actually desire the amenorrhea. We're doing that to her. Asherman syndrome is a side effect of vigorous dilation and curatage. Spontaneous abortion, uh, clearing out a mole, elective abortion, whatever the case may be, the operator is too vigorous with the endometrium and it leads to scarring and fibrosis. Endometrial dysfunction is in the case of ablation and Asherman and is irreversible. The endometrium will never again proliferate and she's also not able to have children. If this is your answer, stop. But if she does bleed, And her uterus is normal, and she is waiting for the signal to come down that says proliferate and bleed. And you have to find out where the issue in the signal is. Is it in the ovary or is it in the brain? To assess that, you get levels of FSH, LH, and the FSH to LH ratio. Because if the problem is in her ovaries, the anterior pituitary is going to rev up production of these hormones to try to get the ovaries to do what they're supposed to do. FSH and LH will be elevated, as will the ratio. If you have elevations in FSH and LH, the anterior pituitary is working, but it's an ovary problem. If it's an ovary problem, the way you assess it is with the ultrasound. What you're looking for is follicles. If there are follicles, she's not in menopause yet. This is Savage Syndrome. Resistant Ovary Syndrome. Savage Syndrome or Resistant Ovary Syndrome is a defect in the FSH receptor. Essentially, the ovaries are totally normal. They're ready to go. They just need that signal. Despite how much signal comes in from the anterior pituitary, they never actually receive the signal because the receptor is broken. This woman can be induced to proliferate her endometrium and bleed, and so she can have children. It's a very difficult thing to do, and adoption is usually recommended. But you can use hormone replacement therapy and artificial insemination to get her pregnant. Otherwise, this is treated just like menopause. On the other hand, if there are no follicles, She is in menopause, and menopause is only pathologic if it occurs in a woman less than 40 years old. Less than 40 years old in menopause, abnormal, and this is usually familial, so her family needs to be counseled. In this condition, you're going to treat her menopausal symptoms. There's no going back, there's no reversing it, and you can see the menopause lecture for more details. Recognize that in menopause and Savitt syndrome, the FSH and LH will both be elevated, and the difference is made by the ultrasound. But let's go back to the FSH and LH test, because this was only the case if the FSH and LH were elevated. It can be instead if there's a problem with the anterior pituitary. And so if the levels are decreased or normal, start thinking about problems in the brain. This is probably going to be a pituitary problem, but both a pituitary and the hypothalamus are in the brain. To assess the brain, use the MRI. What you're looking for is a mass or necrosis. If you see mass or necrosis, it is the anterior pituitary. Problems in the anterior pituitary are Sheehan syndrome, apoplexy, and, an, and a mass. Now it's not going to be the prolactin OMA that we saw above. It's going to be a different OMA. This, this is taught in great detail in the medicine anterior pituitary lecture. But essentially what happens in a, a case of an adenoma in the anterior pituitary, 
is that remember the body is designed to survive. FSH, LH, and GH are actually sacrificed so that TSH and ACTH can be preferentially produced. If there's a mass that's consuming the pituitary, what the body is going to do is switch production to ACTH and TSH. You'll see a giant mass in MRI. The other two conditions you have to know about are apoplexy and Sheehan syndrome. Sheehan syndrome is a problem of birth. Generally seen in patients who have large postpartum hemorrhage, the demand of the anterior pituitary cannot be met by the supply. So it necroses. Essentially, it's ischemia of the anterior pituitary that occurs postpartum. The patient will present weeks to months after birth with panhypopituitarism. Look for the patient who has got low TSH levels, low FSH, low LH. The other one is apoplexy. Apoplexy is the same thing. In apoplexy, you have an, a pre-existing tumor, that, that OMA, but the OMA exceeds its own blood supply and infarcts and necroses. All three conditions of the anterior pituitary, Sheehan's apoplexy and some other adenoma will cause decreased functioning of the anterior pituitary and will be identified on MRI. And finally, if the MRI is negative, it is a hypothalamic issue, the diagnosis of exclu exclusion. Generally, no further testing is required. Help her with her stress and anxiety and have her gain some weight. So, this was a fairly complicated lecture in endocrinology, and you're going to see some of these topics recur throughout the course, especially in medicine. What you need to be able to do is identify someone who's got secondary amenorrhea. Look for the common things. Urine pregnancy test, TSH, and prolactin levels. Check out her medications. And only then, if she is negative for those, begin investigating her access. Start at the bottom and work your way up. Get the progestin challenge, the estrogen and progesterone challenge, the FSH and LH levels, and then depending on those levels, either the ultrasound to evaluate the ovary or the MRI to evaluate the brain. That is secondary amenorrhea. We make these videos for free, and we need your help. Please donate, because without your donations, we can't make any more videos. Please donate.